our service as we usually do on Praise Team Sundays. Um, we're going to play some songs and we want you to sing along. So um, if you would all stand, we'll sing a couple songs together. The first one is called Here For You. <coughs>
Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever announcements and then we'll do some praise and prayer requests. Announcements we have today first of all is that there will be no raise to praise tonight because the youth group will be going to see a play so that we don't know how many we'll have so we just won't do that tonight. 
to remind you of our revival April 1st through the 3rd, which is next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then in the bulletin, you can see the other events coming up in April, the Good Friday, Easter egg, and the Christmas, Christmas, Easter cantata on the 17th. I also remind you of the March Madness food drive located at the front of the church. You can see who's in the lead and respond accordingly. And then also, the Bennett Baptist Church is doing a picture of Calvary, one show beginning each night at 8.15. Admission is free, but the story is priceless. In the event of rain, the drama will be held inside. Refreshments following the performance. So I will leave this up here if anyone needs information or the address. That's coming up. Any other announcements we need to do to bring up today? Okay. Then uh, for prayer request from Sunday school and the family of Steve Woody, I believe this is Charles' first cousin. Uh, he passed away. Phyllis Johnson, who's had some surgery. Jane Lindley, Ronnie Lindley, Sandra Johnson, Sharon Bowers, the situation in Ukraine, and several unspoken requests. Are there any others this morning? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And tell us the good news you had this morning, please. How, how it shrunk. <laughs> well, beyond that, <laughs> they shared in Sunday school that he was responding well to treatments and things have shrunk quite small, the size of some pea or bean, I don't remember what they said. <laughs> you get the idea. Fine is another option. <laughs> Any other prayer requests or praises this morning? All right, if you will, let's stand and we'll go to the Lord this morning as we start our service. Lord, we are grateful this morning that we can come to spend time fellowshipping with one another, worshiping you. We thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayer requests. We thank you, Lord, that you answer them according to your will, thankfully not according to ours sometimes. We praise you, Lord, for Phil's uh, good results. We thank you, Lord, you are the great physician that you can touch and heal beyond what we can even understand. We thank you, Lord, for the, the opportunities you give us to show your love to others. We pray we would be bold in our assertion of you that we would stand confidently that you go with us when we share you with others lord we pray for these that have been mentioned that have lost loved ones we pray you would comfort them you would guide their steps we pray for those lord with physical challenges you know each one better than we do we pray you would give their doctors wisdom and their families comfort and peace we pray lord as we do this go through this service that we would do everything for your honor and glory to magnify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. We're going to have a, a, some more music in just a minute and then I go into a time of open worship. But I wanted to read a few verses to kind of set the stage for that, although the music has done that beautifully. But uh, part of Psalm 143, I put a post out last night inviting people to church and I just uh, listed part of verse 6. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. We need to desire God on a deep and spiritual level. And that to me, just it just met me where I was yesterday when I was looking through some ideas to put out. But I wanted to read uh, 8 through 11 this morning uh, just to get us in the mood a little bit. But it says, let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord, for I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. What a beautiful passage of scripture this morning. Let's enjoy some more music. My only hope 
late at night, my only joy is you. You're all that I need. All that I need is all you. All that I need. Jesus, all that I need yes, I is need. you. Lord, from early in the morning to late. Last week and for the next couple of weeks as we head into Easter, I wanted us to be thinking about some of the things that churches around the world are thinking about as Easter approaches. And one of the things that churches have done for almost as long as there has been an Easter celebration is go through a process of self-reflection and renewal, confession of sins and repentance in order that when Easter comes, our hearts will be ready to worship in a way that Jesus deserves on Easter, right? If he has given us new life, if that's what the resurrection means, then part of us celebrating Easter is claiming that new life. And part of claiming new life is a little bit more each year and a little bit more each day, we get rid of some of the old that doesn't need to be there. And so Christians around the world during this time are celebrating 
uh, celebrating, but they're worshiping, and, and as part of that worship, they're trying to say, is my heart ready for Easter? So that when we sing, he arose, he arose, hallelujah, he arose, or because he lives, I can face tomorrow, or all of the other great Easter songs that we might sing on that day, we can sing and not be thinking backwards. We can sing looking forward and expecting God to do something new in our lives and in our hearts and in our families and in our church. Last week, we looked at the life of uh, Judas and how right there at the end, right before Jesus died, the very week before, he saw that the things he wanted out of his connection with Jesus weren't going to happen, and he traded it for 30 pieces of silver. He traded Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. It's a sum that bought a useless field that nobody else wanted to bury people who couldn't afford to be buried. And so 30 pieces of silver bought a bill, not an income. Somebody said, well, buying a piece of land and you can make money on that land, not if you're burying people who can't afford to be buried. And then you take up for that. It's a bill. And so the, the amount of money was meant to seem insignificant. It's a paltry sum. It's supposed to be an insult. If somebody were to offer you 30 pieces of silver for something great, it was supposed to be an insult. We looked at the book of Zechariah where, where one of the prophets of the Lord had done some work and he said, just pay me my due and I'll be out of the way. And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. Back to the book of Exodus when it was the, the sum that you would charge if your ox uh, killed a, a slave from another human being. And, and so what it was meant to be is, is down here. And, and so, but the idea is if we trade anything for Jesus, it's an insult. Because Jesus is worth everything. And why would, we, why would we consider a trade in the first place? And yet, here's the way I think our lives go. What Jesus offers us is primarily spiritual, faith-based, and heaven-based. By that I mean these eyes will almost never see what Jesus offers. We can see evidence of it. We see a church. But the blessing of the church is not in the walls of this building, but in the things that we receive in our heart from those who meet here and from God who we meet here. And it's hard to kind of say, I, I, you know, to put a, a, um, a value on the things. If it, the Bible tells us that faith is the essence of things unseen, the substance of things that we hope for. In that way, some of the things that Jesus offers us, we won't see while these eyes see. It's not until we close these eyes and awaken them on a spiritual level in eternity that we'll see most of what Jesus has to offer. He walked around this world saying, don't build up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and dust corrupt. Instead, build up for yourselves treasures in heaven that will last forever. But there's an expectation of someday that's going to happen, but right now I don't see it. Not with these eyes. And so how strong is our faith? And if our faith isn't strong, and what it tells us about uh, poor Judas is that rather than looking to eternity and what he'd get out of God then, he just wanted what he could get out now. The Gospel of John tells us that Judas kept the money bags and he was greedy. And so when people put things in the money, man, he would, the, the word I read last week were help himself. Right? And so what was now in his eyes were more important than what was to come. And I think that's a struggle for all of us because it's hard for us to kind of say, here's the situation and I, I'm in and here's the world I can see with my physical eyes. You're telling me to expect something that's going to come later that I can dream about and hope for, but I can't see right now. How many of us if offered two things, one we could see with our hands and one we couldn't see and might not ever see, wouldn't pick what we were sure of? In that way, I don't think we blame poor Judas. But three years worth of being around Jesus might have changed his mind. 
It did the other disciples, but it was hard for them too, right? And so what we see is a battle for people to see the spiritual versus the physical, the things that we put up for eternity. And in the meantime, I think our hearts are tempted to pursue the things that we can see, the things that are temporary. And I want to talk about, we talked about the 30 pieces of silver, which is symbolic. Uh, it's actually just money, right? But it's a symbol of other things. I want to talk about two other things for which we might be tempted to drop our full-on, bought-in-full pursuit of Jesus Christ for a little bit of something right now. What might, what might that look like? And so if you'll join me in the book of, of John, the, the slides will be up here so you could read with me. Jesus in his final week was turned over, he's betrayed by Judas, and he got sent to Pilate. And what happened is the Jews of that day were threatened by Jesus and they looked for an opportunity to arrest him and they wanted him charged and they wanted the death penalty to get him out of the way. The problem is Romans occupied Israel. And the Romans said to the Israelites, to the Jews at that time, you can't put anybody to death. We're, we're in charge of you. We have the authority to put people to death. You don't. And so the Jewish leaders of that time said the only way we'll get them put to death is if we send him to Rome. And Pilate represents Rome in this story. He even says, I'm not a, I'm not a Jew. So, so he's not worried about it. But here's the thing, in order to arrest Jesus, they accuse him of blasphemy because he claimed to be God. But you know what they said? They said, you know what, they'll never, they'll never charge Jesus with blasphemy and put him to death, so we have to charge him for something that Rome cares about. And that was sedition. That was Jesus, them claiming that Jesus wanted to not be the king of the Jews, but to say that he wanted to be the king of of all Jerusalem and, in fact, maybe even Rome. So what they're saying is, whoever the Caesar was at that time, better watch out because Jesus is coming. Now that's something that Rome would put you to death for. A silly religious thing they don't care about because they don't share their religion. But if you say he wants to be king, he wants to be king of the Jews, he wants to set Israel free from Roman occupation, then they care. Incidentally, that's not anything Jesus ever talked about. Jesus wanted to be king in a spiritual way with a heavenly kingdom, not king of the Jews for a season. And so as we read this, it said, Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And so Jesus said, Did you say this of your own accord or did others say to you about me? What's Jesus saying? He said, I never claimed to be the king of the Jews. That's not what I'm going for. I don't want political power. I don't want military power. If I had wanted those things, I would be working for those things. But this is just a stick that the, the Jewish leaders of the day chose to hit me with. And so he moves on. Pilate answered, well, I'm, am I a Jew? I, you know, you, you blame your own people. Your nation and the chief priest delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. What's he reminding us? Not to lay up treasures for ourselves on earth, but treasures in heaven. There are things that are eternal, and our mindset needs to be geared towards the eternal. And so, but it's not, right? And so what Pilate needs to know, are you a power threat to me and Rome, or are you not? Are you looking for power in this world? Or are you not? And Jesus said, If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said, Are you a king? And Jesus answered, You are the one who say that I'm a king. And he said, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said, what is truth? That's a much better question because Jesus was trying to get out the truth and yet if you know anything about power, the people in power like to keep power. That's the number one thing. The number one rule of power is if you have it, keep it. And truth oftentimes confronts power when people are trying to keep it. So people are real uncomfortable if they have power hearing somebody speak the truth and gain followers as a result of that because it threatens their power. And so if you look at the situation, Jesus is arrested, 
Because everybody around him started listening to him instead of the people who wanted to be listened to. And they didn't like it. And so after he said this, Pilate went back outside to the Jews and told them, I found no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man over for you at Passover. They would let somebody free to make the people happy. And so they ask this question, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Right? Which in some way was mocking Jesus, I think. And they cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. And it says in the English Standard Version, Barabbas was a robber. Barabbas, if you look at that word robber and trace it back, wasn't a simple thief. He wasn't a pickpocket. If you remember, Jesus on the cross had people on either side of him, right? What were they? What does the Bible say they were? Thieves. One on either side. How many of you think thieves deserve the death penalty? Well, if you've ever been robbed, (laughs) for the next few days you might be like, "Eh, okay, you might talk me into it then. But going into a store and stealing a loaf of bread or something while wrong might not rise to the occasion. But these were more likely, and the words don't always translate, bandits, and bandits in the way of uh, people who were revolters. So if you know anything about Jesus' time, you're looking about 60 years beforehand, there was a revolt of Jews against the Romans, the Maccabean revolt named after a Jacob Maccabeus. And what they did is they tried to rise up against the Roman authorities and kicked them out of Jerusalem. It was a great idea. Everybody was happy. You know who wasn't happy? Rome. They stomped it out. Rome, from that day on, said anybody else who comes up who wants to start doing these things is going to get stomped out. I think Barabbas was in that line. I think the two thieves on the cross may be in that line. There's a good chance. We don't know exactly. But it wasn't a situation of a petty thief. And so what Pilate was willing to do, instead of handing over the man who did not want to revolt, more than likely he let go a man who probably did want to revolt, who was a bandit and a marauder, somebody who was a revolter against the Roman occupation, all because he didn't want to lose his power. Do you know why Pilate uh, let Jesus go to the cross? Because he was afraid that everybody in that realm, even though he was in charge, if they complained, he would get replaced. At every step, we see this idea of power. Money is a big one. Money is a temptation for us not to follow Jesus and all the things that money brings. But another one is power. Another one is control. Another one is, I want to dictate how things go down here. I want to be in charge, not have other people in charge, because it's much better for me to order my own steps than have somebody order them for me. And when you're in power and you have that position over people, it is really hard to let that go. It is really exceptionally hard to have power and let it go. And so what we see is, if you look at the government, people have power, it's hard for them to let it go. I wonder if that applies to the church. People in church have power and they have problem letting that go sometimes. I wonder if it happens in communities. I wonder if it happens. I think it's a tendency of our heart as human beings to want power. And so I think sometimes we trade temporary power, right, for something more eternal that God is going to give us at a later basis. And so one of the highlights of this whole thing is that Jesus got caught up in a power struggle between the Roman occupiers, between the religious rulers of the day. Even though he said, my kingdom is later and I'm not a threat, everybody took it as a threat. And so what Jesus tells us and how Jesus operated is, if you have power, you're to treat it as something that for which you are steward on God's behalf, and you're to use it to lift other people up and not put people down. But power, what's the saying? Power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what we, when we hear that, we understand power is not everybody's temptation. Money is a lot of people's temptation, but money is not everybody's temptation. And so as we go through this list, we have to figure out what is the biggest temptation. So I want to add one more to our conversation today. And and this one might be a little bit more um, personal to me because this one's more in line with with mine. Not to say I don't want money, not to say I 
I wouldn't enjoy using a little bit of power. I'd try to use it for the, for the right thing until it corrupted my heart, and then you'd have a hard time getting me out because I'm stubborn. But let's jump over a little bit to Matthew 16. Here's an, an uncomfortable passage of Scripture that I think is, is something that a lot of us have a hard time with. And Jesus, and this is again preparing for his, for his uh, eventual crucifixion, he told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And it's an interesting passage of scripture. He says, take up your cross and follow me, which is an idea that you're putting more treasure in heaven than on earth. And he says, if you would give up your life here for my sake, then I'll give you life here. Here, but again, that's, a, that's an ultimate reward kind of thing that we're not, we're not as comfortable saying that we're sure of. Some of us say, well, yeah, we're sure, but we can't see it today. And so we talk about this trade. And then he says, and this is interesting, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? It's very clearly that Jesus is saying, if you work hard to be the richest, most powerful, most comfortable person on earth here... What good is it if in eternity you lost your soul? If you don't have an eternity or your eternity turns south, right? What good is all of this work? And so Jesus, who is constantly living oriented towards the future and oriented towards heaven, he keeps talking about it throughout the Bible over and over. I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am one day, you can be also. And he tells us all of these great things. He, I think he keeps talking about it because we don't keep thinking about it. And he has to remind us over and over again. Because we see what we see. And sometimes we need to see with our hearts what, what, what we can't see. Right? What, is, what will it profit? Man, if he gains the whole world, but he, he loses his own soul. But what's, the, what's the, the, the verse here that we need to look at? What's the idea? See, I think it's not money. And I think it's not power. What does it mean to take up your cross and follow me? I think that's an uncomfortable thing. And the, the thing that keeps coming up in my mind that we have to sacrifice for the kingdom, sacrifice the pursuit of money, sacrifice the pursuit of power, is to sacrifice, and here's what hits home for me, the pursuit of comfort. I don't need all of this stuff, but I sure would like to be comfortable. I don't need too much, but I want enough. Right? And so if you've ever lived where you didn't quite have enough, that, that layer where you can finally... <sighs> that, I think, is what God sometimes calls us to give up. And what I'm saying when I talk about money and when I talk about power and when I talk about comfort and next week we'll talk a little bit more about the essence of all of these which is some control. We need to give control over our lives to God and we keep grabbing that back and all the things that mean with it is that there's, there's this layer where, where God doesn't call us all to not have money. Some great Christians have money. God doesn't call us to all not have power. Some great Christians have a tremendous amount of influence, if that's a better word for you than power. And God doesn't call all of us, when we live in, in one of the greatest countries in the world, we're a lot more comfortable, even if we don't have a lot compared to other Americans, than the rest of the world. But God does call us to let go of those things if they're more important than God. God does say, don't pursue money more than you pursue me. Don't pursue, remember the words that we read out of the psalm, my soul thirsts for you like a dry and parched land. We should desire and search for and work more for God, more for things that are eternal. Our priorities ought to be more for that than everything else that we can see around us. Am I the only one who struggles with that? Am I the only one who has to remind myself that faith plays such an integral role in doing that? So Jesus, you know, foretells his death. We read about that, Matthew 16, 21. This is just a, a few short verses after that, Matthew 16, 24. 
And he tells everybody else, you need to be willing to give up in the same way that I'm willing to give up. Now, if we look too much at that and we see this idea of a cross, Jesus says, uh, take up your cross and follow me. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. What does the cross mean? I, I think as Christians, we have a hard time understanding the term cross in their context because I think it means something different now. Does that make sense? Uh, this is not an insult. How many of you, ladies, guys, maybe too, have ever worn a cross around your neck? They didn't. A cross was a symbol of brutality of their oppressor. A cross was a symbol of hatred for their kind because they were the ones being crucified, not the Romans. A cross was an embarrassment to anybody who was put to death on it for their whole family for a generation or more. Do you know why that lady, she anointed Jesus with the... With the um, the bottle of ointment, because if you were uh, killed as a criminal, which Jesus was, he was crucified as a criminal, then you didn't get to be anointed with your body with that stuff after death. They just put it in a hole. That's what they did to Jesus. And it was supposed to be embarrassing. And it was supposed to be shameful. And it was supposed to be an embarrassment to your whole clan and your tribe. And, and all of these things. And nobody gloried in the cross until Jesus came. And took the symbol of shame. And took the symbol of suffering and turned it into a symbol of love. We see it as a symbol that is redeemed by Jesus Christ because of his love to go to the cross on our behalf to pay for our sins that we couldn't pay for. And he took that upon himself and he did it for us. And the cross now is a symbol of love and it's a symbol of the glory of God. And we celebrate it and we put it up in our churches and we wear it as jewelry. Not in that day. When Jesus said, take up your cross... He was telling them to take up something for which they felt shame. What do you mean cross, Jesus? Are you calling me a criminal, Jesus? I've tried to stay out of trouble. I tried to follow your word. I try to stay out of the, away from all of those people. I hang out with the good guys, Jesus. And he says, wait a minute. The people who stand for truth, they don't like me because I do. And if you stand for the things that I do, you remember what he said? They're not going to like you either. They put me to that. They're not going to like you either. So if you're on my side, give up wanting to be liked. How about that one? We put that up there. We got money, power, and comfort. How about likability? Give up the desire to be liked by everybody around you. Because if you like truth the way I like truth, truth makes people uncomfortable. If you like power more than you like me, if you, that's the way Pilate was. Why didn't Pilate become a believer? He knew Jesus was innocent. Go all the way back to poor Judas. What did Judas like more than Jesus? Jesus, stop talking about that stuff later. I want the money now. And when those purse strings were cut off, he said, hasta la vista, Jesus. See you later. What's the, I, I need to lighten this up a little because I don't want us to go, this is a great thing and we're leading to Easter and we're, so let me take, can I tell you a little joke? We're talking about the cross, I'm going to tell you a little joke. What's the difference between an, an alligator and a crocodile? One will see you later and one will see you after a while. That's a good one, right? <laughs> Judas said, after a while, crocodile. There's more, I'll save you, right? But what do we say to Jesus? In this moment, Easter's coming. Easter's coming. And we need to stand up and as Christians on that day celebrate more than we ever have the new life that we have in Jesus Christ because of his great love. It's hard to do that with a divided heart. It's hard to do that when we're wanting other things as much or more than we want Jesus. And so where do, where do we go from there? Uh, C.S. Lewis has a great quote. He said, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. Forgive me, but this is what he said. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. But if you want religion to make you really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. Christianity wasn't meant to make us comfortable. Christianity was meant to make us uncomfortable until we get to our home in heaven. We're aliens in a foreign land down here. And Jesus said, you get too comfortable, you forget, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. 
as we wrap up this service, right? I think we need to realize the situation that we're in. And, it, and it's not one that calls for so much comfort and power and money, although if you have those, I'm not saying throw those away. God, they may be a gift for God to bless you and others through you. I'm saying we can't want those more than we want. We, can't, we have to have our priorities straight in all of that. The right, the right shoe for the right job. How many of you go home and you put on a nice comfy pair of slippers? Ladies don't mind raising their hands. Some of the guys have been like, yeah, I do too. Right? Those slippers are comfortable. When you need to go out and do yard work, how many of you look for the flip-flops? The slippers, the indoor slippers? No, what do you need? A sturdy Crocs? I was headed in the right direction. Right? But you're going to be down weed eating in that ditch. I want something sturdy. I want something that's thick enough that if the snake bites me, it doesn't get to my skin. <laughs> I, want, I want the right shoe for the job. On this earth, we don't need slippers. We need work boots. We've got a certain amount of time, and then Jesus returns for us. What have we done with that time? Let's stand for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you are good to us in so many ways as we get ready to celebrate the glory of your love for us as expressed through Easter. The new life, everything that has everything to do with those ladies and those disciples going to the grave and seeing it empty. We pray that in the weeks leading up to that, you'll prepare our hearts for that day. You'll bring out in our hearts the things that don't need to be here anymore the things that are a part of us yesterday, not a part of our tomorrow, to make, new for, to make room for the new growth that is going to happen in our hearts, in our lives, in our family, in our community, and in this church. If there's sin in our hearts, help us to confess it and repent. If there are desires for anything other than you, if we have our own idols, God, Help us to get rid of those, to see them for what they are and to put you as number one. And when we get to Easter, God, we will sing. And we will praise you. And we will glorify you with a fresh and a clean heart, looking forward to great things that you're doing in our midst. Lord, we pray for all of these things, for the wonderful people that are in this room, that you would bless us all as we continue to worship you and as we look forward to a wonderful Easter. We offer all of these prayers in the glorious, wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. We're dismissed.